37. At the jump point, energies flowed through the jump ship's drive core, focused, then discharged in a space twisting field that created something very small to a small temporary black hole. In that instant, the NVIDIA simply vanished, moments ahead of the arrival of enemy dropships. Aboard the NVIDIA, Thor felt a familiar crushing sensation, experienced the flash of momentary blindness as the void yawned around him, swallowing the ship in its eerie roar. The wan and distant disk of Trell, the myriad stars beyond dwindle into red, vanished into infrared, then were wiped away as they'd never been, to be replaced by the arc-brilliant, fiercely radiating point of blue-white splendor that was their target star. Thor found himself laughing helplessly in his relief and joy, while Varney pounded him on the back. They had made it. Clayden stood in the marble corridor outside the palace reception hall. He unhooked the holster strap on his Theta automatic heavy pistol and waited. As senior tech for the guard's mech unit, he'd been assigned to Captain Nolam's personal staff. The desertion of many of the old Lancer personnel and all three working mechs had left the tenth guards without a mech company, and its senior tech had nothing to do but follow Nolam. But Clayton's thoughts were not concerned with mechs now, nor with the battle raging north of the city at the spaceport and beyond at Thunder Rift. Like Grayson, he too craved revenge. Clayton blamed Grayson for his father's death in the fire that had also destroyed their home. If it hadn't been for the young Commonwealther, Baronir would not have made a visor call that must have alerted someone in the government to Baronir's pro-Commonwealth loyalties. That someone had had connections with the bandit forces at the castle, had been in on the betrayal of the commandos to Singh's forces, had been behind a successful plot to bring down Trelwan's government. Not until Clayton had met Grayson in the halls of the palace did he realize that Carlisle too was a pawn in the hands of the giants who were conspiring for control of Trelwan. That had been what had killed Baronir. Upon learning that Grayson had taken refuge with Baronir, the conspiracy had moved swiftly to take Carlisle, capture Clayton, and silence Baronir once and for all. Though it had been Grayson Carlisle's raid on the port that had freed him, Clayton's grief and bitterness made him refuse the offer to join the Lancers. When Lieutenant Nolam approached him after the Lancers' disastrous raid on the castle, Clayton accepted the offer to tech for the new Lancers. The unit was being regrouped under his own command, Nolam said, and would be transferred to a guards regiment. The fact that he was Baronir's son carried little weight with Nolam. It was clear that Clayton had no love for Grayson Carlyle. Besides, tech-trained personnel were too valuable to waste in political quibbling. During his tour of duty with Nolam, Clayton actually spent more time going through the computer logs and comm records in the palace and at the guard's HQ than with his Max. Tech Sergeant Riviera had been a master of computer programming and searches, and he'd passed that mystery on his Aztec protege. By the time Clayton met Grayson again in the palace corridor, he'd uncovered much of what he wanted to know. He had learned, for example, who in the palace had been talking to Singh, and he knew that Singh was a draconian special forces commander, war leader for the Red Duke. He knew who had leaked word of the planned assault on the castle to Singh's forces, who had planned the revolution to begin with Rickle's arrival, and who had ordered the murder of King Jeverid in his bed. And he knew who in the palace had betrayed his father to the enemy Max. He'd used the time since, several standard days, watching for his opportunity to even the score. Clayton heard steps on the far side of the great double doors of the reception hall. When the doors swung open, a pair of royal guards, submachine guns strapped high across their chests, stepped through and flanked the doors. General Adele and Captain Nolam followed on their heels. Behind them were more soldiers and His Majesty King Stanek. Ah, Clayton, Nolam said. Fall in. We must get to headquarters. Things seem to be going badly for the Duke at Thunder Rift. Nonsense the general said. 
One lance against two companies? Don't be ridiculous. Claydon fell into step behind Nolum, took a deep breath, then dropped his hand to the steta in its holster. A guard shouted as the pistol came out. Claydon pivoted, bringing the heavy gun up in both hands as he swung halfway around, his finger already tightening on the trigger. Selector set to full auto mayhem, the machine pistol spat and stitched a line of red horror across one of the royal guards behind him, then across the chest of King Stanek. Utter astonishment froze on Stanek's face as the force of the bullets smashed him spread eagled onto the mirrored floor of the reception hall. Clayton kept turning, the gun still barking in his hand. A second guard clawed at his face and thrashed against a splintering door frame. Captain Nolum drove for the floor as General Adele bellowed a command to fire, then died, his last order choked in his bullet-ripped throat. The two surviving guards had their Rugen SMGs in hand now, spitting fire. The slugs tore through Clayton's chest and stomach, spinning him back and into the reception hall. By the time he slid to a stop in the pooling blood of the former king of Trelwen, he was dead. Grayson sat in Duke Rickle's office, a Spartan cabin in the Alpha, a dropship of the Combine warship Huntress. The flag of truce that had brought him this far rested in one corner. With narrowed eyes, he studied the Red Duke, one of the three men he had wanted so desperately to kill. Of those, only Singh was dead, burned in his crusader by the exploding fuel tank. As for Grayson's duel with Rickle, it had ended prematurely on the slope of Thunder Rift, with both mechs too damaged to continue fighting. From the moment Rickle had turned away from the rift, Grayson's passionate hunger for revenge had diminished. I have just had word that the Invidious has returned to Trelwan's jump point, Grayson said quietly, purposefully omitting the polite and proper, my lord and your grace. It was a minor spite and served to remind the proud man of who was the victor. By now a Commonwealth task force will be on its way. You don't know that, youngster. No, perhaps I don't. Perhaps I'm bluffing, and the invidious no more than jumped out and returned to pick us up. But the question is, can you afford a chance? Rickle did not answer, and Grayson pursued his advantage. You wanted this planet as a base for operations against the Commonwealth, but it doesn't do you a damn bit of good if the Commonwealth already knows you're here. Your forces will be tied down by blockading fleets, your ground forces harassed by landing and fighter probes, and my people, of course. You'll find it expensive. So expensive, you'd have been better off staying home in the first place. What are you suggesting? The Duke asked, proud and unbent that you evacuate, now, while you still can. Grayson leaned back in his chair and folded his hands across his stomach. Could he play this in a way that Rickle could accept? He chafed inwardly at the need to act a peacemaker now, but there was no other choice. The Lancers could not continue to fight, not on Rickle's terms. The trick was to make the Duke see that he could not continue to fight on his terms either. If you stay... Grayson continued. My people remain on the field, harassing you and making life miserable for everyone, themselves included. We'd rather see you off, Trelwyn, and at this point I suspect you'd rather see that too. You would let us go? My word on it, Your Grace. Frankly, Thunder Rift was hard on both our forces. We have no wish to continue fighting, not unless you force us to. That was both an understatement and stark misrepresentation on Grayson's part. Though his Aztecs would soon have five battle mechs working again from among the wrecks left on the ridge, at the moment the Shadowhawk was the only fully functional battle mech remaining. Nor could Rickle suspect that, at that moment, Grayson could call upon exactly thirty unwounded men. There were so many dead, and so many more wounded, and there were some injuries that seemed deeper than those of flesh and blood. Where were you? Laurie had asked, pain in her eyes. There'd been no anger in the words, only hurt and something like sorrow. 
With her mech burning around her, she had called for his help. He knew how she feared death by fire, and it must have seemed that he'd abandoned her. He'd reached out for Lori, and she turned away. No, Gray, not... just no. There had been a violation of the trust between them, and no telling if that particular wound would ever heal. It seemed that the price for revenge was high, much higher than those caught in the crossfire could afford to pay. And what vengeance was there after all? What could restore the dead? You're right, of course, Rickle said. That simple admission, the sag of his shoulders, caught Grayson by surprise. As allies, the Trell Indigs would have been useful. But we can't afford to garrison a backwater desert like Trellwen, not when the planet is in revolt and Stanek dead. No, the action, the real action, is elsewhere. The inner sphere? Rickle shrugged. So, if you want Trellwen, youngster, it's yours. And welcome. A dreary, savage place. Speechless, Grayson could only nod. Duke Rickle was requesting that his men and machines be allowed to leave Trelwen, that their troops keep their guns and equipment, that everything remains as if the Duke's men had never come to Trelwen in the first place. What of all the dead? Grayson thought. Larison, Anselman, Clayden, Ari, Kai Griffith, his father, and so many more. Full privileges, Grayson said at last. And the sooner you burn for your starship, the better. Epilogue Tension! Ranks of grey-clad men snapped to attention in the sullen light of the westering sun. Master Sergeant Ramage did a sharp about and saluted Grayson. Company all present and accounted for, sir. Grayson let his eyes run along the rows of men, each with his duffel bag of equipment, uniforms, and personal gear at his feet. Beyond the last rank, the mechs were lined up as well, towering above the assembly. The two wasps and the stinger had been salvaged on the field and repaired. The locust and the shadow hawk had been completely refitted. All were newly painted, too, with emblems of a death's head in grey and black against a red background on each mech's left leg. Grayson's eyes strayed to the locust, as though trying to see past armor and sensors to the woman inside. Very well, Sergeant. I will inspect the troops. Sir! Ramage did another smart turn and faced the ranks. The man sounded more like a master sergeant every day, Grayson thought. For that matter, the troops were looking more like troops. Ramage at his heels, he began walking along the line, checking men, uniforms and weapons. For what? Grayson shrugged off the rebellious thought. For military appearance and readiness, of course. For reassurance that the three platoons were tight and sharp and ready to board a dropship at his back. And to remind them of who they were. When the remnants of the Trelwen Lancers had emerged from Thunder Rift to meet Grayson, there had been a scant thirty men, unwounded and ready, for duty. The Locust, the single surviving mech, had been badly damaged, with a machine gun out, ammo storage wrecked, heat sinks gone, and large sections of the hull armor half melted away. There had been little to commend them as a victorious fighting unit, except for the fact that they had won. Trelwan's royal guards had been somewhat taken aback by Sargod's response to the warriors. News of the Battle of Thunder Rift was more rumor than fact, twisted and changing even as it spread. The only clearly discernible facts were that Rickle had led his army up to the rift and been thrown back. A lone raider at the starport had destroyed the Combine Forces communication station and much of their fuel. Two days later, the Combine dropships had left, taking every mech and off-world warrior with them. And then a dropship from an incoming freighter had descended at the port, and the victors had returned to the city. Their reception by Sargat citizens had been a minor revolution in its own right. With the government in total disarray, 
After the deaths of Stanek and Adele, there'd been no one to issue an order for Carlyle's arrest. It was doubtful that there were troops on Trelwyn who would have carried out such an order, for the green coats were citizens of Sargat as well, and totally caught up in the carnival atmosphere that surrounded the hero's homecoming. As for Grayson, he had not feared the government's response. Though he had only two functional mechs, the Locust and his battered hawk, that was more than Sargod could muster in its own defense. Many of Sargod's troops, militia and guards alike, had joined the Lancers after Thunder Rift. The unit survivors had become the experienced cadre that trained and seasoned the new troops. Grayson had already drawn up schedules so that training would continue aboard the Invidious. There were many men, it turned out, with no attachments, no reason to remain on Trelwyn. When Grayson issued the call for volunteers for the new Comec regiment, they had come forward, this time leaving behind their earlier rivalries. The Lancer's new reputation had achieved that. Grayson turned to face Trelwyn's new leader. General Varney had taken charge of the military upon his return to the city from the dropship. Marshalling the popular support of the now reinstated militia and many of the Royal Guard as well, the defense ministers and military staff officers had elected Varney as military governor until a new king could be nominated. It was entirely possible that office would also fall on Varney's shoulders. Of all Trelwyn's leaders, only he had the power and authority to hold the military's openly warring factions together. The Lancer's new reputation had also achieved that. We wish you wouldn't go. There is a place for the Lancers here, Varney said. They're not the Trelwyn Lancers anymore, remember, General? But you could stay. Look, Grayson, don't hold what happened against all of Trelwyn. Please reconsider. Hendrix still hangs over us, not to mention the Combine. But with your unit, we could... Grayson looked past Varney, to where Mara watched him from the cluster of ministers and officials. The forces that had torn Trelwyn society apart were still there, for all the deaths and bloodshed. Grayson wondered now, how could he have been such a fool in regard to Mara? He thought he'd been using her, unaware that she was using him to win useful information and to control him for the sake of her father's plans to become king. His eyes snapped back to Varney. Please, sir, they are my unit now, and I will not have the Lancers be the focus of any more power struggles. We have our own destiny. He gave the general his hand, which the old man clasped firmly. Varney would be a good leader. Trelwyn might yet have a chance to combat the inner sickness of power and strife. The Commonwealth will be informed of the situation here, Grayson said. I doubt that the curatists will bother you any more, but a great death legion will seek employment elsewhere. He took an odd pleasure in that name suggested by Sergeant Ramage and made official by acclamation among the troops. As a newly formed military regiment, they were small, yet with only five mechs and 147 troops, but they had a ship and a pilot and the hope of a place among the embattled houses of the inner sphere. Perhaps at Farcod they would find whatever was left of Carlyle's commandos. The regiment could be built to full strength elsewhere, and Grayson knew he would meet Rickle and Valendel again one day. A man fights for his comrades on the firing line, Griffith had said, but home and family are what brings him to the firing line in the first place. Looking across at the troops boarding the dropships, Grayson felt a shrill of pride, of accomplishment, and of belonging. He wanted to leave Trelwyn as quickly as possible now. He needed time to assimilate what had happened here and to examine the changes in himself. He saluted Varney with a smile. By your leave, General. The line of mechs waited until the last of the troops filed past and up the ramp of the waiting dropship. Grayson strode toward the Shadowhawk at the end of the line and swung himself up on the chain ladder that hung down the machine's flank. Inside the Hawk's cockpit, with a neural impulse helmet on his head, an electronic voice sounded in his ears. We're ready, boss. 
Let's get the hell out of here. Right, Lori. Lance formation. Right turn and embark. At this moment, Grayson felt content. Lori was important to him, both as a valued NCO and as a valued friend. He'd promised her the time to seek her own healing, while he sought his. Meanwhile, they were still friends. In time the wounds would heal, perhaps even before they reached Farcad. The dropship's battle mech ports gaped open. Grayson Def Carlyle's new family filed up the ramps and boarded their new home. Glossary Autocannon A rapid-firing, auto-loading cannon mounted on some mechs and heavy weapons carriers. Light vehicle autocannon have calibers ranging from 30 to 90 millimeters, while heavy mech autocannon may be 80 to 120 millimeters or more. The weapon fires high explosive or armor piercing shells. Because of the limitations of mech targeting technology, its range is limited to less than 600 meters. Company A tactical military unit consisting of three battle mech lances, or for infantry, three platoons with a total of 50 to 100 men. Infantry companies are generally commanded by a captain. Crawler A tracked military vehicle. Various designs carry troops, cargo or weapons. Crusader A heavy battle mech, weighing 65 tons with a top speed of 65 kph. It is heavily armed, even for a mech, mounting a laser, a heavy machine gun, and amassed LRM batteries in each arm, and six SRM tubes on each leg. ECM, short for Electronic Countermeasures. This is broadcast interference to disrupt enemy radar, radio, or other electronic equipment. Hovercraft, a vehicle that travels several centimeters above the ground on a cushion of air created by large fans inside a rubber of light metal skirted plenum chamber. Hovercraft may be designed as scouts, transports, or weapon carriers. They are fast, highly maneuverable, and can travel over land or water, but are hampered by rough or broken terrain. They are also called skimmers or GEVs, ground effect vehicles. HVT, hovercraft transports, are a military hovercraft used to carry personnel or cargo. HVWC, the hovercraft weapons carrier, is a military hovercraft, smaller than a transport, mounting a missile battery, PPC, or other heavy weapons. IFF, short for Identification Friend or Foe. This is a system of signals from an onboard transponder that can be detected and used to identify the vehicle, especially in combat. Inferno, a special shoulder-launched missile designed as an anti-mech weapon. It explodes several meters from the launch tube, spraying the target with white phosphorus or a similar flammable compound in a jelly base. Infernos are not carried aboard mechs because of their flammability. IR. Infrared is light at wavelengths too long to be seen by the human eye. Infrared radiation is emitted by heat sources such as running engines or living bodies and can be detected by equipment designed for use in the dark. Lance. A battle mech tactical combat group, usually consisting of four mechs. Laser. An acronym for Light Amplification through stimulated emission of radiation. As a weapon, it damages the target by concentrating extreme heat on a small area. Battle mech lasers are designed as small, medium, and large. Lasers are also available as shoulder-fired weapons operating from a portable backpack power unit. Certain rangefinders and targeting equipment employ low-level lasers as well. Locust. A light, non-humanoid scout battle mech designed for extreme speed and maneuverability. Weighing 20 tons, it has a top running speed of 130 kph. It is armed with one medium laser and a pair of heavy machine guns. 
LRM, abbreviation for Long Range Missiles, indirect missiles with high explosive warheads. They have a minimum extreme range of several kilometers, but are accurate only between about 150 and 700 meters. Marauder, a heavy non-humanoid assault battle mech, weighing 75 tons with top speed of 65 kph. It is heavily armed, mounting a heavy PPC and a medium laser in each arm, and a 120 mm autocannon over its back. Marauders are extremely well armored and difficult to knock out, particularly favored for the psychological advantage conveyed by their fearsome appearance. PBI, short for Poor Bloody Infantry. This is the battle mech slang for non-mech troops. Phoenix Hawk, a medium battle mech weighing 45 tons with a top speed of 100 kph. It mounts one medium laser and a heavy machine gun integral to each arm and carries a heavy laser in an arm rifle mount. It is a particularly useful blend of speed and maneuverability in battle mech combat. Platoon, a tactical military unit typically consisting of 50 to 60 men, commanded by a lieutenant or a platoon sergeant. A platoon may be divided into two sections. PPC, short for Particle Projection Cannon, a magnetic accelerator firing high-energy proton or ion bolts, causing damage both through impact and high temperature. They are among the most effective weapons available to battle mechs. Though they have a theoretical range limited only by the line of sight considerations, the technology available for focusing and aiming the bolt limits effective range to less than 600 meters. Regiment, a military unit consisting of two to four battalions, each consisting of three or four companies. A regiment is commanded by a colonel. Rifleman, a medium battle mech weighing 60 tons, with a top speed of 65 kph. It mounts one autocannon and a heavy laser in a twin barrel assembly on each arm and a pair of lasers in the torso. Shadowhawk, a medium battle mech weighing 55 tons, with a top speed of 85 to 90 kph. It mounts a medium laser on its right arm, five LRM launchers in its torso, a pair of SRM launch tubes on either side of its head, and a backpack-mounted, over-the-shoulder, large-caliber autocannon. SRM, abbreviation for short-range missiles, direct trajectory missiles with high-explosive or armor-piercing explosive warheads. They have a range of less than one kilometer and are accurate only at ranges of less than 300 meters. They are more powerful, however, than LRMs. Stinger, a light scout battle mech. The Stinger weighs 20 tons, with a top running speed of 100 kph. It is armed with one medium laser and two heavy machine guns. TO and E, abbreviation for Table of Organization and Equipment, the breakdown of a unit's personnel, order of battle, and equipment including vehicles and weapons. UV. Ultraviolet light is radiation at wavelengths too short to be seen by the eye. Special scanning equipment can see by UV light. WASP. A light scout battle mech weighing 20 tons with a top running speed of 100 kph. The WASP is armed with one medium laser and a pair of SRM launch racks. Wolverine, a medium battle mech weighing 55 tons, with a top speed of 85 kph. It mounts a heavy caliber autocannon in its right arm, and six SRM tubes in its torso. High on its chest, just below the head, is a ball turret mounting a medium laser.